Hello and welcome to everyone to the latest episode of the Global in the Granite State podcast. We are so glad that you have decided to listen into this month's episode, looking at the Paris Climate Accords and the challenges that the world faces as the climate changes. My name is Tim Horgan, and I am the Executive Director at the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire. I am also your host for this podcast. As a reminder, the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire is a nonpartisan membership organization, and we rely on the support of our members and donors to continue to bring great programs like this to you. There are a number of ways you can support our work through membership, donations, or even just sharing our programs with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you wouldn't also mind leaving a rating or a comment for this episode, it would be greatly appreciated. We want to hear from you, and you can reach us through email at council at wacnh.org. Today's episode dives into the global crisis that is climate change. Where do things stand today? What can be done about it? Do I have a role in all of this? These questions and more are answered here for you, and all you have to do is listen. Let's get things rolling. I just think that it's the existential question of our time. It is the crisis that underlies everything. It seems the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire cannot get away from talking about crises. Whether it is the coup in Myanmar, or the ongoing war in Ukraine, or the future of cyber conflict, it just doesn't seem to end. Well, as April 2021 is Earth Month, leading up to Earth Day on April 22nd, we thought our crisis of this episode would be global climate change. Recently, I was reading Climate Insights 2020 survey that looked at opinions about climate change held by the general U.S. population. The findings of this report were interesting, to say the least. While we know that 97% of climate scientists believe in man-made climate change, you may not know that 82% of those surveyed believe that climate change was at least partially caused by humans. A similar number felt that this will be a serious or somewhat serious problem for both the world and the U.S. I wanted to dive a little deeper into this topic, particularly as the U.S. has just recently rejoined the Paris Climate Accords. So, I reached out to Julie Cerqueda of the U.S. Climate Alliance to find out more. The U.S. Climate Alliance was launched in June of 2017 by Governor Inslee of Washington, Governor Brown then of California, and Governor Cuomo of New York. And it was in response to the administration's intent to withdraw the United States from the Paris Agreement. At the time, and actually still until today, it is the only country that has ever withdrawn from the agreement. And so it was a way for them to really mobilize a group of governors to stand up, reiterate the importance of collaboration on climate change, both domestically and internationally, but most importantly, for them to work together to achieve the goals of the agreement and to demonstrate that the United States could still maintain and push forward with climate leadership. Also, to get a more local view of this issue, I spoke with Rob Warner, League of Conservation Voters State Director here in New Hampshire. Given the fact that the Biden administration is back into the agreement in, with the Paris Agreement and is back into the global diplomacy business, that doesn't mean at all that these local efforts in municipalities and among businesses and, and academic institutions is going to slow down. It's really important that work be done on the state level. As you are all aware, global temperatures have begun to rise, to which the climate has manifested these changes in many ways. Droughts, Fires, hurricanes, tornadoes, and even snowstorms have become more extreme and unpredictable. 
All of these weather-related events have been both humanitarian and economic disasters that can stretch across the world, particularly in a world of just-in-time manufacturing with global supply chains. These are the things that are driving the push for changes to the way things have been done since the Industrial Revolution. You know, we had a year or two ago major droughts coupled with major flooding in the Midwest that just eradicated farming communities and their ability to actually like harvest crops and eliminate a lot of their farm income. It undermines all of the investments that we're making in infrastructure by washing out roads um, and, you know, destroying power lines. It undermines all of our investments in development assistance overseas. And so we'll put money into actually like helping communities get out of poverty only to have a major storm come through and wash everything away. And so I do think it is the crisis of our generation. And we have failed for the last two decades to take enough action to actually stop, you know, catastrophic impacts. And so we have this very short window ahead of us in the next decade to really be bold and to be ambitious in the way that we need in order to actually address the crisis. And I think the other thing I'd add to that I think the president and the governors have really captured is that it's not about making sacrifices per se. There are opportunities in how we address climate change to focus on the industries that are going to revive the economy, that are going to strengthen our infrastructure, create good paying jobs. And so there's tremendous opportunity in us moving to a zero carbon future. It's not all just cataclysmic, you know, <laughs> fire and brimstone. Um, it's really about also opportunities for just improving our, our quality of life and our way of life. A little closer to home, climate change will have more of an impact than simply a few extra snow days for students or more hot summer days. There is a real potential for serious economic harm to many of the traditional industries here in the state. Many organizations in New Hampshire are taking a smaller, more local view of this massive global challenge. We just participated in an event this week at League of Conservation Voters where we were talking about the outdoor industry, winter sports, tourism, and the climate change impacts on that. It's really important. It has an, it's an economic driver for the state of New Hampshire. It's part of our lifestyle. And if we do not change course over the long term, we really are going to lose our ability to have a good ski season, to really be a center of maple sugaring. We're seeing effects on that. So it is a lifestyle of New Hampshire. It is part of our culture. It has a big economic impact. And, you know, not taking action is going to be very costly. But given the fact that we have this national renewed attention to climate, both internationally and here, I think we can hopefully work to mitigate the impacts of climate change because it really does impact us. And I think that's one of the things you're seeing is that, you know, why are people more cognizant of it and why are they more supportive of action? Because I think they're, they're seeing it more and more, unfortunately. But it does have the benefit of, I think, spurring action and political will to start to do the things that we really need to do. Speaking of the things we really need to do, this is a good point in time to bring in the Paris Climate Accords. Signed by 197 countries in 2015, this is a legally binding international treaty designed to spur action on climate change. Just as a reminder, if you remember the big numbers to keep emissions and temperature rise actually under 1.5 centigrade. And that's just, that is really the big news that came out of Paris. And it's really interesting at the time, six years ago now, that it was the island nations who were going to be submerged, who really pushed on that in terms of ambition, because the original goal was two degrees. And so they really went to the the powers to be, so to speak, and said, look, this is just not enough for us. This is, you know, this is a, an existential threat to our islands, and you just need to be more ambitious. Ambition can be great if it is sustained, or if there are legal mechanisms in place to ensure efforts are undertaken in order to move the world forward. The Paris Agreement is historic in that it is the first climate agreement that requires action by all countries. And so there was a lot of misinformation under the Trump administration about this being a bad deal for America. And that is absolutely not true. The beauty of the Paris Agreement is that each country 
whether you're a developed or developing country is required to take action. That is the sort of the nature of the agreement. But it allows each country to decide what they feel like is their contribution. So their climate target is their contribution to the solution. And then what's binding is the requirement to be transparent in how you report the methodologies. And it creates a mechanism so that every five years, countries are asked to come forward to review their climate target to indicate their long-term strategies for reducing emissions, say by, you know, mid-century or something. But the idea there is that there's a mechanism for everybody to review what those contributions are and assess whether or not they're sufficient. We know currently the crop of targets that have been put forward are not even close to what we need to get to. And then in addition to that, we're actually not globally on track to even meet those targets. So there's still a lot of room and work to be done. The agreement's not perfect, but it is the first one that addresses that. This is obviously not the first climate agreement implemented to try and tackle this issue, and many of the previous attempts to craft a legally binding treaty failed. The most recognizable of these failed attempts was the Kyoto Protocol, which the U.S. Senate did not ratify. The big complaint from the United States under the Bush administration at the time was that it didn't hold countries like China to the same standard as they did the United States, which was their rationale for pulling out, and so Paris doesn't do that. The hope is that by making each country identify their own emissions reductions, they are more likely to achieve them. Then, by forcing them to be transparent about their efforts and goals, public pressure and peer status can be used to push countries farther. Just the nature of the crisis is a global one, and so we do need all countries at this point to take action. It's obviously most important for the major emitters to do that, but we've just gone so far beyond what we should have that we need all hands on deck at this point, and the only way to do that is if you have an international agreement. As this is an international agreement to tackle a global problem, it takes efforts from everyone to make the progress needed to meet these goals. As Julie mentioned, we are not on track to hit those goals. However, yes, progress has been made, but it's not ambitious enough to meet these goals. And so now we find ourselves in a situation where we need to be even more ambitious. I think what you'll see later this month as a building block towards the COP26 in Glasgow in November is this climate conference that is going to happen at the White House on April 22nd and 23rd. Apparently, what we're hearing is that there will be a renewed and greater ambitious target that we as a nation will be bringing forward to go into that COP at the end of the year. And it has to be more ambitious, not only for the world, but also for us taking a vacation, frankly, over the last four years in, in this area. But that, that is expected to be unveiled, a very ambitious proposal at the end of the month during the Earth Day week. It has been very clear that the U.S. has pulled away from its global leadership role in this area and others. Over the past four years, a lot has changed in the world, and many countries do not see the U.S. as a reliable partner anymore. The thinking goes, well, if U.S. policy is going to swing dramatically every four to eight years, how can we trust that the U.S. will do what it says it will? Therefore, the question becomes... Does it even matter that the U.S. is back in the Paris Agreement beyond the potential for significant carbon reductions? It means a great deal because there's a lot of respect for U.S. leadership, even in this time where we're, we're frankly going to have to repair and rebuild. And we are embarking on that project as a country to do that because, you know, it was not only withdrawing from the Paris Agreement, it was the drawing from the Iranian nuclear agreement. It was sort of the, the constant criticism of NATO and the undermining of NATO that did not help in the sort of international relations generally and overall, as far as our position in the world. So there's some mistrust, frankly, that has to be built back, but I'm sure the administration is is about that project. But it means a lot uh, symbolically, it means a lot in US leadership globally. It also means something financially because the United States is a prime mover in financing and building the financial structures that are necessary to help countries that do not necessarily have those resources meet these ambitious goals. Because we all have to be moving in the same direction together. So that financial aspect and that fund 
that we didn't fund over the last four years, but we had made commitments during Paris to do so, that's going to be reinvigorated. So that's really important. So it's really multi-leveled in terms of U.S. leadership in a global way. People are looking for it, and, then, and I think you'll see it. If we can then all agree that U.S. leadership on this matter is important, don't worry, I know agreement does not come easy these days, and that there is a lot of work left to be done to meet these goals, what are some of the steps that everyday people can take to help push this forward? It can sometimes seem like it is too big of an issue to have much of an impact on, but there are ways you can help enact change. Well, the first thing is we have to keep voting for climate leaders. That is hugely important. And so keep going to the polls and keep making sure that the people we're electing actually believe in climate change, that it's a man-made crisis, and that they're they're willing to collaborate with others to actually put in, in place solutions. I think that that is by far the most important thing. The other is that, you know, I look across our states and they are working so hard to promulgate new rules, put in place new programs to support their communities. And we really need to vocally support them in that effort. And so there's there's plenty of opportunities for public comment. There are hearings, there's letters to the editor. So whatever you can do to actually encourage your leaders to be brave and to be more ambitious, to put out those policies, that is extremely helpful. So participating in those processes makes it possible for them to do the hard work that they've been doing. So anyhow, so those are the two things that I would suggest. And then, you know, the third is just our own sort of behavioral change. You know, at the end of the day, we still need these big policies to move. We still need industry to make better decisions. But part of that is just using our pocketbook basically as a, a, as a motivator. And so when you're thinking about purchasing your next vehicle, think about actually purchasing an electric vehicle instead of a gas powered vehicle. The next time you're replacing your appliances, replace them with energy efficiency ones and actually try to transition away from gas. Consider taking advantage of tax credits to put in place solar power on your roof. I would just challenge people to maybe change sort of the mindset of it being one of sacrifice to one of opportunity. And I know that not all of those things are affordable to everyone. And so, you know, doing the things that also bring other benefits to you and your family. And so things like switching out an old stove actually has really important health benefits. And so like a gas, a gas oven, for example, is linked very closely to childhood asthma. And so you're doing it not just because of the climate crisis, but because it's good for the health of your family and your community. So I would think about it probably in, in those terms and, and just me as a, a consumer. And those are sort of the principles that I'm trying to follow as well. This is, again, a, an issue that can be approached in so many ways and everything helps. The individual behavior helps in terms of the lighting in your home and how efficient your home is, because efficiency means that there's less demand on the energy system as a whole. And that helps everyone, it helps cost helps carbon emissions. It helps the fact that you don't have to build possibly additional infrastructure of legacy energy systems if you are reducing demand. But then you also have the importance of local action in your community and what local communities are doing, not only to save money in terms of energy generation, but to play a part in reducing emissions all across the board in communities across the country. And then, of course, you have the state and then federal and then obviously ultimately international action that has to really be all up and down the chain to make a difference. And think that over the last number of years, people have really come to the fore in terms of understanding the impacts of climate change and are very supportive of actions to meet that challenge. One of the continuing complaints you hear in opposition to taking action on climate change is that big name celebrities and politicians who claim that climate change is an existential crisis, yet they do not seem to be changing their lifestyles. Greta Thunberg, along with many other climate activists, were protesting that so many people were taking private jets to climate conferences, adding to the problem in a way that most people could not dream of. In a world where actions do speak louder than words, it is easy to see why these skeptics would not be overly worried. I do think that we should call on celebrities and others, though, to also being part of the solution. It's not just talking about climate change as being an important issue, but really actually 
walking the walk. You know, I've been reading Bill Gates' new book about the climate crisis, and he actually addresses this and talks about how how he personally has his own private jet, and they have, you know, a number of homes. And what he's doing is really investing in uh, industries that can help solve the climate crisis. He himself is looking, investing in biofuels for their planes. So I think he acknowledges the negative contribution that people in his economic status are making and then trying to take some steps to alleviate that. While this is a global issue, we have now seen that local action can make a difference in the fight against climate change. Many people and governments right here in New Hampshire are doing their part to help meet the goals outlined in Paris. There are several cities around the state that are being very ambitious about their goals and trying to build renewable energy projects within their communities. There are nine of the 13 mayors in New Hampshire signed on to Climate Mayors, which is a national initiative that the first instance is that the mayor has to agree to the principles of the Paris Agreement and build a climate action plan for their community that really sort of gets on that road in terms of reducing carbon emissions in your own community through a whole variety of projects and means. Although not everyone is on the same page here. Well, so we have not had a lot of engagement with Governor Sununu. I think New Hampshire is one of the only states in the region, actually, that is not part of the U.S. Climate Alliance, and we would certainly welcome New Hampshire's participation if the governor wants to really lead on climate change. You know, we are here as a coalition of governors that are supporting each other, and we're here to provide technical resources and assistance to anybody who wants to tackle climate change. Even if the state is not interested in joining, we're still here to help them. You have states like Massachusetts, you know, that have a Republican governor that have some of the most progressive climate policies in the nation. They actually just passed a huge climate bill that sets a net zero target for mid-century. It has probably one of the most ambitious targets for 2030 as well. And, you know, I think the governor has been very thoughtful in thinking about how to frame and put forward policies that are really focused on economic growth and on creating good paying jobs for the residents of Massachusetts. And I think New Hampshire could get there as well, but taking action, that's the priority. Given all of this, what are the chances of success for the entire world to reach the goals outlined in the Paris Climate Accords? It seems there's a long way to go and no shortcuts to be taken. I think it is really going to require a tremendous amount of work and and far more than we've ever seen in the past for us to actually get on the trajectory we need to get to in the next four years, if we're looking at 2025. I think that we need to work really hard to get the numbers right for 2030 and probably aim for that being when we're finally like at on the pathway to get to 2050. And I do think 2030 is like that, that critical year. So as much as we can do ahead of that is going to be important. So You know, there's a lot of policy levers that we can pull. There's a lot of tax incentives, for example. I think, you know, again, the big thing is like consumers and voters trying to get industry and government to move in that direction. And we all as individuals have those levers that we can pull, but it's going to require a lot of a lot of work. I think the other thing, though, that is working in our favor is that you ha- you now have leadership in the United States that has actually made this a bedrock priority. So we have an all of government approach now, which is fantastic. I think we need an all of society approach that is pulling in all of the communities that would benefit from that transition to a clean energy economy. And I think having, you know, President Biden and Special Envoy Kerry now at the helm, that they're going to use the political might of the United States to really exert pressure on a lot of other countries, as well as to provide hopefully some carrots to get them also to move in that direction. So I think especially with the election, I'm feeling much more optimistic In addition to that, you've also seen commitments from big, big companies to get to, you know, 100% GHG reductions by mid-century or earlier, and actually making investments that will align them with that as a goal. So I'm also feeling like we finally have industry and not not sort of just the ones on the margin, but like big companies like Amazon, for example, that are really actually putting money into getting themselves to be 
climate leaders, and that is going to be huge. There's still big industries we got to tackle, and transportation is really hard, but we're in a much better place, I think, action-wise today than we have been ever in the past. And so now it's whether or not we can keep up and accelerate that momentum that's going to determine whether or not we we get to, you know, reducing half of global emissions by 2030, so in nine years, which is where we need to be. I wanted to thank both Julie and Rob for joining me and sharing their insights on this complex issue. There are, of course, no easy solutions, but I hope that you have taken some useful information from this and identified some action steps that you can take in order to help solve this issue. You've already taken the first step by listening to this interview, and it is now incumbent on you to be the change you want to see in the world. Thank you again for listening and being a part of our global community. As a reminder, please let us know what you think of this episode, and do take the opportunity to listen to previous programs. The World Affairs Council of New Hampshire always has interesting programs going on, so do join our mailing list on our website at www.wacnh.org, and subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss a beat. This has been a production of the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire. Our host, producer, audio technician, editor, and jack of all trades is Tim Horgan. The theme music for our podcast is Admin by A.A. Alto, and the interlude music is Environment by Organide. Until next time.